Hi, this is the lecture on bipolar spectrum disorders. So in the recorded part of this lecture, we're gonna talk about just an overview of the bipolar mood disorders and the um, manic and hypomanic end of the mood spectrum. In class, we're gonna discuss the relationship between bipolar disorder and um, personality types and creativity. So the three bipolar spectrum disorders that we currently recognize are bipolar one, bipolar two, and cyclothymia which are basically distinguished primarily by severity, similar to how a major depressive episode is distinguished from persistent depressive disorder by severity. So as a reminder, we've talked a lot about the role of the monoamine system in regulating all of these different systems, um, these different aspects of cognition and behavior. These are all of the aspects of cognition and behavior that are influenced by mood disorders in opposite directions. So, so far we focused on the depression end of the spectrum. Today we're gonna to talk about the manic end of the spectrum. So mood is elevated, excited, happy um, a lot of the time, although not always, sometimes it's really irritable or anxious. Um, there's a decreased need for sleep. So people who are depressed might experience insomnia. People who are manic don't feel like they have to sleep. It doesn't feel like insomnia because they're not trying and failing to stay asleep. They feel rested after a relatively short amount of sleep. Many people with mania experience a loss of appetite. Again, this is different than, than the loss of appetite experienced in depression where people might articulate it as like, I know I have to eat, but it just feels like too much work. It just doesn't, the food doesn't taste good. Nothing seems appetizing. In mania, it's more like people are so focused on other things and so happy and excited that they don't experience hunger. They don't notice that they're hungry. People in a manic episode have lots of energy. They expend a lot of energy and they may at the more extreme ends of a manic episode experience psychomotor agitation, which looks like a lot of repetitive sort of non-goal directed movements. Whereas in depression, people experience decreases in cognitive functioning that, that are experienced as like brain fog, having trouble making decisions, having trouble concentrating. People with mania have trouble concentrating too, but not because they have a hard time forcing their brain to work. It's because their brain is working so fast that it's hard to settle on one thing to think about at a time. This is called flight of ideas where they're just having so many different thoughts and ideas and all of them seem really important and really exciting. So attention kind of shifts from idea to idea really rapidly. Whereas in depression, people feel a lot of guilt and worthlessness and low self-esteem. In mania, people experience grandiosity. They feel way better than they usually do about themselves. They think that they are great at things. They think that unlike people with depressive realism, they think that they are really, really good at things like way better than the average person overestimates their skills. And then lastly, sexual functioning isn't a diagnostic symptom of actually either depression or mania, but in depression, it's really common for people to lose interest in sex. Sex is one of the appetitive drives that's regulated by the uh, monoamine system. So in mania, many people experience hypersexuality where they feel a lot of sexual arousal and attraction, or they're just really like, they are in a really like outgoing um, pleasure oriented state of mind where one thing they might do is have a lot of sex or engage in a lot of masturbation. Okay, so the key defining factor for bipolar disorder is mania. Mania and hypomania are two separate constructs, but really they just represent um, levels of, sim of symptoms on a spectrum. So mania is essentially like the most severe form of elevated uh, maladaptive mood and hypomania is a much less severe manifestation. So criteria for a manic episode, it has to be at least seven days. So whereas a, a major depressive episode has to be at least two weeks, only seven days of persistently elevated, expansive or irritable mood. In addition to this alteration in mood, so typically elevated, there also has to be an increase in goal-directed activity. So people who are in a manic episode are really busy. They have a lot of ideas, they have a lot of goals, they have a lot of things that they want to accomplish. So this elevation in mood and increase in goal-directed activity is accompanied by three of these symptoms. There need to be more symptoms if the if the change in mood state is only to irritability, but don't worry about that too much. These are just kind of the arbitrary cutoff criteria. And we're thinking of this more as a spectrum. So these are the symptoms of being manic. 
having really high self-esteem, grandiosity, decreased need for sleep, being way more talkative than usual or talking really, really fast. Pressured speech is like when you have something really important to say and your thoughts are racing and your mouth just like can't keep up with how fast your thoughts are moving or how much you want to say what you have to say. Flight of ideas, so again, lots of new, exciting ideas that your brain is jumping around to or racing thoughts. Being really easily distracted because again, your attention is really easily grabbed by everything in your environment. This increase in goal-directed activity, which again, the, the goal-directed activity can have to do with like your job. It can have to do with your social life. People who are in a manic episode can become extremely outgoing. The goal-directed activity can be sexual, either with other people or with yourself. Or as an alternative to this increase in goal-directed activity, people might experience psychomotor agitation, which you could think of as kind of like a really extreme end of the spectrum of goal-directed activity because psychomotor agitation is like movement and activity that's actually not directed towards a goal. And then the last criteria for mania is excessive involvement in risky activities. So this can look like doing daredevil things, driving too fast, driving drunk, having unsafe sex or having sex that you wouldn't have if you weren't in a manic episode. It can also look like risky spending. So going on shopping sprees, um, it can look like drinking too much or doing drugs that you wouldn't normally do outside of a manic episode. For any of this to be considered a manic episode, these symptoms, the elevated expansive or irritable mood and the goal-directed activity plus three or four of these symptoms has to cause impairment. Or if it doesn't directly cause impairment, it has to, the person has to be hospitalized because they're a danger to themselves or other people. Or extreme alterations in mood, just like extreme depression can cause psychosis, extreme mania can also cause psychosis. So a manic episode can be diagnosed when these symptoms are present and there's impairment or hospitalization prevents impairment or the person becomes psychotic. A hypomanic episode is basically a much, much less extreme version of all of this. So it's, the duration can be shorter. A hypomanic episode only involves, only has to involve four days of elevated mood and goal-directed activity. All the same symptoms are present except in a hypomanic episode, they can't cause impairment. They can't cause hospitalization and they can't cause psychosis. Hypomania is just a less extreme and in fact, often not impairing form of mania. So whereas someone who's manic might become like delusional about how great they think they are. They might think that they are a world-class practicing surgeon when in fact, they've never been to medical school. Someone who is in a hypomanic state, they know they're not a surgeon, they know they can't like take out your appendix, but they might think that they could pierce your ears for you, even though they've never done that before. So they think more highly of their skills than maybe they should, but not in a way that's dangerous to other people or that would cause them impairment or that departs from reality. In terms of goal-directed activity, someone who is manic might quit their job and decide to become a ballerina because they always wanted to and they feel like they'd be really good at it. Someone who's hypomanic wouldn't do something that disruptive to their life. They would keep their job, but they might stay up all night practicing ballet and show up at work the next day not having slept at all. So these are just some people um, talking about their experiences of what it's like to be manic. Could you give me a general explanation of what it's like to be manic, both the positive and the negative sides? Uh, well, generally speaking, when I'm manic, I'm very... In Sorry. Energetic, I'm excited, I'm busy, I'm doing lots of stuff, which is the positive side because I get a lot done. Um, the downside is that I can spread myself too thin and actually overtire myself, and then that leads to a downside and, and leads into a spiral depression. When I go into a fit of mania, I can be the most productive person ever. I'll get a million genius ideas in a few seconds. Unfortunately, I rarely follow through with them. Um, but on the same token, I can get a lot accomplished if I stay on the high. Like, I'll make a big long list of things to do, like clean the house, go do this extensive workout, paint all my walls, and I'll do it all. I'll stay till the wee hours of the morning to get it done as long as I stay on the high. But as soon as I flip and um, 
I could be in the middle of them and I can crash and it'll be the stupidest little tiny thing that will set me off, just a scene in a movie or somebody saying the wrong thing. But um, when the high is gone and I crash, it's just like everything comes falling down around me. When I'm manic, I turn into everyone's best friend. I'm very friendly, I'm very happy, and very light. You feel real euphoric and you think that there's nothing that you can't do. And the further it goes into it, the less sleep that you get, the less that you're actually able to do. You find that well, you, you, when you're so high, so to speak, and hyped up, you don't notice that you're not getting things done. And then the thoughts that you're thinking bounce in and out so fast that you can't keep track of them. And so my, um, my parents and brothers and sisters and things like that, they were noticing what was going on. Of course, I wasn't. I was thinking everything was great. Everything is fine. I've got lots of energy and able to do everything that I thought I wanted to do and could do, but not realizing that and so uh, it, get, it, get, it gets intense and worse from there when you're in a full-blown manic episode and uh, your thoughts get distorted. And after the fact, you can look back and you can actually remember some of the thoughts that you're thinking and you, you say, what was I thinking? And so it's not a comfortable situation after the fact, but while you're in it, you feel so great, you know, creative thoughts, uh, tons of energy to act on those thoughts, and it, it's it's a wonderful feeling, but it's very destructive after the fact or during it. And then when you realize that after the fact, it's not not fun to to be there. It's embarrassing to realize what you were thinking, saying, or doing really is not what's accurate or positive sometimes, and it's it's uh, very emotional after the fact. Driving down the freeway without a steering wheel on your car. It's more than likely you're going to crash and, and have a problem. It's just a matter of what you're going to run into and how bad it's going to be. Uh, it, it escalates and, and snowballs. And especially if there's any aggression or physical confrontation involved, uh, it gets out of hand quickly. Okay, so a couple themes in a lot of these accounts, so they often talk about mania escalating. So often mania will start with small alterations in mood, not that dissimilar to how some of the first person perspective videos describe depression. There are some small changes that might not be noticeable at first. This is the transition from euthymia into hypomania. You might have more positive mood, you might feel more motivated, you might feel more energetic and not feel like you need to sleep as much. The longer you stay in a hypomanic state, if you're someone who's prone to mania, the more likely it is that you'll con convert into mania. And one driver of this is sleep. People who are in a hypomanic state don't sleep as much. And sleep deprivation for people who are vulnerable to mania is a major trigger of mania, as we'll talk about. So the longer a manic episode goes on, the worse the symptoms tend to become. Manic episodes may be experienced as kind of pleasant and exciting at first, but the longer they last, the more damage they do to the person's life and functioning. And the more likely it is that the person will end up being hospitalized because they've become a danger to themselves and because they have no insight into the dangerousness of their behavior. That's another theme that a lot of these people are mentioning that when they're in a manic state, they don't realize it. That's having a lack of insight, a lack of awareness of the effect of your own mood and behavior on your functioning. So mania tends to escalate. The longer mania goes untreated, the more likely it is to become severe, the more likely it is to lead to really negative outcomes, like doing something dangerous or becoming psychotic. So everyone in that video, of course, was presumably in a euthymic state or maybe a depressed state, but not in a manic state when they were describing what it's like to be manic. This is a first person perspective of someone who's in a manic episode um, that she chose to post later when she was not in a manic episode anymore. But as you're watching this video, think about some of the symptoms of mania, racing thoughts, um, flight of ideas, grandiosity, elevated expansive mood, increased goal-directed behavior. Pay attention to some of the experiences she's having and narrating for you as you watch this video. And I'm gonna let it play for a while, um, 
feel free to skip ahead to later parts of the lecture once you kind of get the idea. This isn't like the worst episode that I've had by any means. Um, like worst episode I cut off my hair, one of the worst episodes. I actually overdosed in another bad episode. So yeah, this is definitely not the worst, but um, I think just like the way I'm talking and like how my attention span is very short and like the things that I'm saying aren't making any sense. And I think that's all like overall like a good representation of mania. So yeah, I'm just gonna insert the clip right here so you guys can see for yourself and I can stop talking about it. I don't know why I'm describing it when you can just see it. Baby, look what you've done, 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 done. To a genius realization. <laughs> okay. Okay. Just needed to move. <laughs> I don't know why I needed to move. I'm gonna sit down. I'm gonna sit on the floor. Okay. Okay, so I just came to a real so I was just shuffle playing my music. Okay, I was just shuffle playing it. Like anything could come on. I don't know what's gonna come on. And then Okay, am I, am I gonna put you down? I know how to put you down. Just stay, just stay somewhere, phone. Ah, okay, let's put you here and see if you stay. Oh, you stayed, okay, so. I don't like this here, because I can see the mess and you just like, oh, shit. You fell, are you okay? Okay, so, I'm going to go over here to this side of the floor. Okay, so, I just had this genius realization and I was just like, I need to just tell, just tell myself. Okay, so Stockholm Syndrome by One Direction is the perfect depiction of mania. Like everything about that song, like even from the beginning, like, uh, I don't remember what the beginning is, but I just, and then they're like, I know they'll be coming to find me soon because Eventually someone's gonna get me and someone's gonna be like get better and like stop this and like whatever like hey like you're just or or just I'll be like that or like like I felt like someone was in my house the other day and so I was just yeah but whatever so then th th that's when it gets too much and it's too much and it's too much for anyone right but like now it's just like it feels like my entire body is like being tickled <laughs> what, what a thing to say what a weird thing to say. No, but like really, like I just feel like my entire body is like wired up. Like there's just so much energy, like all the way from like my head to my toe. And I'm on 700 milligrams of Seroquel a day, so I shouldn't feel this much, but I'm feeling so much and it feels so good and I don't want it to stop. And I just feel like the Stockholm Syndrome song by One Direction just really, really exemplifies what my is like. So. <laughs> I need to like, do I want to make another video about like bipolar disorder because I feel like I'm just like just um exploiting it for views which is like whatever like yeah I guess like why not hey like make the best out of the situation right because like this kind of sucks but also this doesn't suck and I feel so good and I like feel so bad for people that can't feel what I'm feeling right now oh my god like the floor is so nice like the floor is so good the floor is just wonderful yeah I just oh my god so one time I wanted to make candles and I just like, I couldn't, I couldn't make candles. And I picked up need, n knitting, 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 needles, knitting, needles. Oh my God, if I was a superhero, I feel like I could be like someone that wears a cardigan because I really love cardigans. Mom bought me three new cardigans today. That was fun. But um, I could just, I could wear cardigans and I could have knitting needles and then I could just pull out the knitting needles. Oh my God, I think that was a, like a villain in Word Girl. I think I just stole that entire concept up from previous kids so don't even listen to me i'm being a plagiarizing whore why did i start recording i had a very specific reason oh yeah stockholm syndrome i just needed to like write down this revo like the revolution but like i've opened up my notes and then i just i just i caught it my fingers were just shaking too much and i figured hey like i could record my oh my god i dropped Okay, so I'm going to stop it there, um, but some symptoms of mania of being in a manic episode that you may have noticed, elevated mood throughout most of this, she's 
seems really happy and seems like she's experiencing a lot of positive affect, even though she also seems aware that being in the manic episode isn't good and um, that there will be negative consequences for this. There's also moments where she shows some sort of irritability when she gets frustrated, like when she is trying to position the phone and drops it early on. Um, you might notice that she seems kind of distractible. She's sort of jumping from one idea to another. She's talking fast in some places. She may be having flight of ideas where she's like having a lot of internal thoughts that she's not able to articulate as quickly as she can think them. Um, and the whole reason she recorded this video in the first place is because she had an idea that at the time seemed really good and really important. She also alludes in the video to other times when this has happened, like when she wanted to take up different hobbies in the past, and, but didn't stick with it during that episode. So her channel is um, actually pretty educational and informative about borderline, sorry, not borderline, bipolar disorder. So I recommend watching more of her videos if you're into YouTube. Okay, so we talked about what a manic episode is and what a hypomanic episode is. Like I said, mania and hypomania are the basis of bipolar one and two diagnoses. Bipolar one disorder, the, the main criterion, the most important one is that someone has had at least one lifetime manic episode. You, even though bipolar disorder is thought of as like shifts between mania and depression, having had a documented depressive episode is actually not required for the diagnosis. Um, all that is required is having had a lifetime manic episode. But in almost every case, like there's so few documented cases of unipolar mania that bipolar disorder is basically by definition almost manic and depressive episodes. But because just having lifetime depressive episodes is diagnostic of major depressive disorder, the key to bipolar disorder is that you also had at least one manic episode in your life. Bipolar 2 disorder, the criteria are identical, except you can't have had a manic episode. It has to have been a hypomanic episode. And in the case of bipolar 2, largely because hypomania on its own doesn't really meet the criteria for a disorder, it's by definition not impairing. Um, because if it was impairing, it would be diagnosed as mania. So to meet criteria for bipolar 2, you have to have had at least one hypomanic episode and at least one lifetime depressive episode. As we'll talk about in class, there are some people who are just kind of hypomanic all the time. It's kind of their personality. And again, as we'll talk about, these people are more vulnerable to depression and bipolar disorder, but not everyone who has this hypomanic temperament, this personality style ever develops depression. And so because hypomania itself isn't um, by definition distressing, only having lifetime hypomania is not a disorder. But the key takeaway, and as we'll talk about throughout this lecture, is that mania and hypomania are mood disorders. And so people who have this mood vulnerability tend to also have the vulnerability to depression because the vulnerability to depression is just more common. And if there's something wrong in your mood regulation system, probably the monoamine system, but also the, hypo, the um, circadian system and the HPA axis, if these biological predisposing systems are altered, the first disorder that will probably happen from that alteration is major depressive disorder. If they're altered in more significant and substantial ways, you'll have major depressive disorder, but on top of that, you'll also have mood alterations in the other direction. Mood alterations in the other direction in general are indicative of a more severe illness than major depressive disorder. So bipolar one, having a manic episode. Bipolar two, having both hypomania and depression. Cyclothymic disorder is, has also been called bipolar light um, or subthreshold bipolar disorder. Similar to persistent depressive disorder too, it's basically a very chronic but less intense manifestation of bipolar disorder. This is when you have at least two years where you have numerous periods of hypomania and numerous periods of depression but neither of those periods meets the full symptom criteria for a hypomanic episode or a major depressive episode. So if it, during your periods of depression, you don't have five out of those nine depression symptoms or you don't have them persistently for two weeks, during the hypomanic periods, you don't have um, at least four of the symptoms of hypomania, but you do have some. 
in cyclothymic disorder, the hypomanic periods and the depressive periods are distinct from each other and they may be separated by periods of being euthymic. One or the other, hypomania or depression, has to be present for at least half of that two year period. And the person can't be symptomat asymptomatic, symptom free for at least for um, more than two months. In many cases, people with cyclothymic disorder eventually convert to bipolar one or bipolar two disorder, but the, the rate of that, like the number of people who convert is actually not super clear. And there's lots of reasons for that. Reason number one is that having subthreshold hypomania and subthreshold depression may not be experienced by the person who has it as distressing or dysfunctional enough for them to seek treatment. So many people with cyclothymic disorder don't know they have it. They don't see themselves as having any disorder. If we were, if we like surveyed the entire population and identified everyone who has cyclothymic disorder, my guess is that the number who would convert to bipolar one or bipolar two at some point would be closer to the 50% end of the spectrum. But because often when people are, when people do convert, when they're diagnosed with bipolar one or bipolar two, they may not retrospectively remember these periods of time when they were mildly hypomanic and mildly depressed. Um, and the lifetime prevalence of cyclothymic disorder is relatively low, it's but higher than the lifetime prevalence of bipolar one or two at 2.4%. Um, Sorry, I'm gonna go back and share with you the lifetime prevalence of bipolar one and two disorder. Okay, sorry, so let's come back to this slide. I paused the recording and double checked my numbers because something on the cyclothymic slide didn't look right. Okay, so first of all, you don't need to memorize these prevalence numbers. The takeaway here is that compared to major depressive episodes and even compared to people with chronic recurring major depressive disorder, the prevalence of bipolar spectrum disorders is really low. The prevalence of bipolar one disorder is less than 1% lifetime prevalence in the United States. The prevalence of bi the lifetime prevalence of bipolar two is even lower. Although I question that number because again, many people don't notice hy um, hypomania. They don't experience it as problematic. They don't consider it a disorder. And when clinicians are not really careful to assess for the presence of hypomania when they're diagnosing someone with depression, it can be easily overlooked. So probably the prevalence of bipolar two disorder is higher. It's probably higher than the prevalence of bipolar one disorder because it's a less extreme manifestation of the same psychopathology, but it's underdiagnosed. It's just really difficult to diagnose because if you think it's hard to remember a two week period in your past when you were persistently sad and met criteria for a major depressive episode, it's so much harder to remember a four day period in your past when you were persistently happy and feeling great about yourself and getting a lot done. So the takeaway here is that the prevalence is low. The prevalence of cyclothymic disorder is also low. It's a little bit higher actually than the prevalence of either of the bipolar one or two disorders. Overall, the lifetime prevalence of bipolar spectrum disorders is in the 2% range. And the important thing is that this is way lower than the lifetime prevalence of major depressive disorder. Okay, so all this stuff about how hypomania is not impairing, by definition, it's not distressing, it, and by definition, it's not dysfunctional. And in fact, many people like don't even know that they have it because it, it's generally not perceived as disordered. There are downsides to it. So one symptom of hypomania, not everyone who's hypomanic has this symptom, but it's relatively common, is engaging in a lot of risky behaviors. This can have consequences. So you can spend too much money, but if you just happen to have a lot of money, that won't lead to enough impairment that it crosses the threshold into mania. You can end up starting altercations, arguments, fights. You can have unsafe sex or sex that you regret. Um, you can engage in dangerous substance use or have accidents because of risky behavior. You can just like end up making commitments that you don't want to keep because you are in a great mood when you make them, but then later when you're in a euthymic mood or a depressed mood, they sound horrible. None of these things are necessarily dysfunctional or distressing and, or dangerous enough to cross over into being considered clinically significant impairment, but it's not like they're great. Being hypomanic all the time definitely has some downsides. In addition to that, people with hypomania don't always feel uniformly positive. Sometimes they can feel irritable 
irritability is, is associated with alterations on both ends of the mood spectrum. But when someone is manic or hypomanic and irritable, that irritability is really like ramped up and agitated and kind of has nowhere to go. People with hypomania can also feel anxious and agitated at the same time. And often people who are hypomanic have insight and they know that their mood isn't normal. They know that their mood is somewhat deviant. And so they can feel subjectively like too good. They know that it's not right or not healthy to be feeling as good as they're feeling. And that kind of puts a damper on those good feelings. So hypomania, on the one hand, by definition, it's not dysfunctional, distressing, or dangerous. But on the other hand, that doesn't mean that it's good. It's not necessarily a positive state to be in. So one confusing thing about the bipolar spectrum is that bipolar one disorder is diagnosed in the presence of mania only. You don't need to ever have had a documented depressive episode. If you've had a manic episode, that's enough to meet criteria for bipolar disorder. But you might ask like, well, we know that lots of people have unipolar depression. There's people who experience mood alterations only on the negative end of the mood spectrum. Are there people who experience mood alterations only on the positive end of the mood spectrum? And the best available evidence that we have is that of the tiny number of people who have manic episodes of the less than 1% of the population who has manic episodes, less, well, about 3% of them, two to 3% of people with mania. So two to 3% of less than 1% of the population does experience unipolar manic episodes. Um, but the the important takeaway is that 97% of people, if you follow them for 20 years, who've had at least one manic episode will go on to have a depressive episode. So when people have mania, they inevitably almost always have mood alterations on the other end of the mood spectrum too. That's mania. With hypomania, it's actually not clear because again, even though there's downsides to mania, they're not significant enough that we would consider it psychopathology on its own. So Unipolar hypomania, as we'll talk about in class, may be more of a personality type. And when it stays that way, when it's only hypomania, that in and of itself may not be a disorder. So diagnoses in the DSM sometimes come with specifiers that allow the diagnosing clinician to give a little bit more information about how the symptoms are presenting. With bipolar disorder, both one and two, some specifiers include rapid cycling, which means that someone is shifting back and forth between depressed and manic episodes relatively quickly. It can include mixed features, which means that someone meets full criteria for either a depressive episode or a manic episode, but they also have one or two symptoms of the other end of the mood spectrum. So this can be really dangerous when someone is depressed, they meet five out of the nine depression symptom criteria they feel terrible about themselves. They feel really unhappy. They feel no positive emotion. They're not eating or sleeping well. Their, their thinking is clouded and they're thinking a lot about suicide. But at the same time, they also have a lot of energy and they also have an increase in goal-directed behavior. This combination of mixed features can put someone at really elevated risk for attempting suicide. Bipolar 2 has the same atypical and melancholic specifiers that depression does. Those specifiers refer to the symptoms that someone has when they're in a depressive episode. Bipolar 1 or 2 with anxious distress, this also applies to the depressive episodes, but it can apply to the manic episodes too. Someone can be really depressed, but also, as in Andrew's, Andrew Solomon's account of his depression, experience a lot of anxious distress. And as I said, someone can be manic and have really elevated positive mood and lots of energy, but also feel really anxious at the same time. Both ends of the mood spectrum, really severe depression and really severe mania can involve psychosis. The idea of mood congruence has to do with whether the content of someone's psychotic experiences, so that the things that they hallucinate or the del delusional beliefs that they have Sometimes that's consistent with their mood state. So when someone is really, really, really depressed and they have psychotic features, when those psychotic features are congruent with their mood state, they might have a delusion that their existence is like the reason for human suffering or that just seeing their face is going to make their family members feel unhappy. These are thoughts that someone with depression might have, kind of, but someone who has mood congruent psychotic features to their depression 
wouldn't be able to have any insight that those thoughts are maybe unrealistic. They would just completely believe those thoughts. Someone with mood congruent manic symptoms basically is really grandiose. They think that they are the best thing ever. They wildly overestimate their abilities. They might even go so far as to think that they have like superpowers or that they're the president. These are called grandiose delusions. Um, or they might have like hallucinations with really positive, happy content. Um, in both manic and depressive episodes, the psychotic features can be mood incongruent, which means that they don't necessarily relate to the content of depressive symptoms or manic symptoms. So they might just be like seeing, you know, seeing or hearing people that aren't there, having delusions of reference, thinking that like people are talking to them through the TV, have persecutor, yeah, sorry, persecutory delusions where they think that people are out to get them. And those types of delusions don't necessarily align totally clearly with either depressive symptoms or manic symptoms. We'll talk a lot more about psychotic features and the kind of mood general psychotic symptoms in the next couple of lectures. And then lastly, another really severe specifier for depression in bipolar disorder, but also in unipolar depression is catatonia. Catatonia is an extreme form of psychomotor retardation. So in his account, Andrew Solomon talked about just feeling like stuck, like he wanted to pick up the phone and call someone and ask for help, but he just felt like he could not move his body. That is kind of an example of catatonia. Catatonia refers to just like complete tonic immobility, a lack of muscle tone um, that's caused by a mood state. So I'm talking about the specifiers here because the depression experienced by people with bipolar disorder actually tends to be much more severe and is more likely to have some of these features, which are markers of severity, than unipolar depression. Okay, so this is Professor Kay Jamison. She is an expert researcher on mood disorders, and she also happens to have bipolar disorder herself. So this is her talking about her experience of psychosis during a manic episode. I've primarily been psychotic when manic, uh, which is not uncommon with mania. And um, it's been mostly when I've been manic, it's been a very exhilarating sort of thing, including the hallucinations. Um, I went around the solar system. I went to Saturn uh, in my mind's eye. I went through star fields. It was, it was a glorious sort of ecstatic experience, which is frequently the case with mania. When you think about a lot of the great religious ecstasies, there's a very manic quality to that, and very grandiose. They tend to be very universal, cosmic, related to everything's related to everything. Um, but I also had some very bad ones of, you know, uh, hallucinating myself as dead or as um, just covered with blood. I mean, it, mania is can be as terrifying as it gets. It is certainly as insane as one gets. And so it's it's frightening when it gets out of control, but there are periods of mania when it can be extremely attractive, unfortunately probably, but true. Okay, so that's just one example of the types of more mood congruent. So like really grand, really exciting, really ecstatic hallucinations and also mood incongruent hallucinations during mania, like seeing yourself as dead or seeing yourself covered in blood. So again, we're talking right now about psychotic depression and the more severe end of the negative mood spectrum because these experiences are much more common in people with bipolar disorder than they are in people with just unipolar depression. Um, we'll talk more about psychosis and psychotic disorders in the next two lectures, but the, the main and really only difference, well, symptomatically the only difference, etiologically there's, there are differences, but the difference between psychotic depression and other types of psychosis is that when people have psychotic depression, they're only psychotic during depressive episodes. When they're euthymic, they are never psychotic. And again, psychosis during depression is really strongly linked to bipolar disorder, so much so that if a patient comes in with only a history of depression and they have psychotic depression symptoms, there's a really strong likelihood 
that they actually have bipolar disorder and that in the future they'll go on to experience a hypomanic or manic episode. Hi everyone, this is Sally and today I'm going to speak about psychotic depression. In my last video I spoke about psychotic mania and I've been psychotically manic a couple of times but I've also been psychotically depressed. And as I said in my last video, not everybody who has bipolar disorder will experience psychosis. However, some of us do. I've been psychotically depressed once and it was the worst experience of my life. I had had a psychotic manic episode prior and immediately after that episode I became depressed and the depression lasted for the better part of a year and in the depths of that depression I was psychotic. I experienced visual hallucinations and they revolved around death and I was also paranoid. I thought people wanted to do experiments on me and I believed people could hear my thoughts. Uh, the hallucinations happened at this one, sort of one isolated incident. I had done a night shift, I work as a nurse, and I had done a night shift which was not a good idea at all. And that morning afterwards I was walking around the botanic gardens near my work and I um, saw some figures which were my visual hallucinations and I immediately drove home. I went into my room, I shut my blind and I hid under my covers and I think about a day or two after that I was admitted into hospital and I was hospitalised for 10 weeks and during that episode I was treated with ECT or electroconvulsive therapy. So I had a two-week course which consisted of six treatments and that ECT had pulled me out of that depression like nothing had done before and I was pretty much back to normal after those two weeks. <clears throat> I only really told one person about what was going on during that time because I was very paranoid, I didn't trust many people and that was the nurse who was admitting me. I don't really have um, tips for people who are experiencing psychosis or who are psychotically depressed. I don't really remember much of that time and um, I just everything was just um, too scrambled for me to really comprehend what was going on in the world at the time. But I do have um, a tip for people who are caring for others who are experiencing psychosis. And it's really simple. It's just empathy and validation. The nurse who I did tell about what was going on, uh, she was admitting me into hospital and I knew her from previous hospitalizations. And when I told her, she said... I feel so sorry for you, Sal. This is horrible. This is going on for you. But we're going to um, work to fix this and to fix it as soon as we can. And in that moment, I felt safe and I felt supported. So what she did was quite simple, but it was very powerful. Most importantly, if you have experienced psychosis or you are experiencing psychosis, know that it can be treated and it can be treated quickly. And also know you're not alone. Thanks. Okay. So she mentions ECT in that example, like we talked about in class, electroconvulsive therapy is a kind of a treatment of last resort for really severe depression that's not responding to other treatments. And it's much more likely to, use, to be used in depression and psychotic symptoms. Okay. So I know these numbers, sorry, I know these numbers are a little different than the numbers on the last slide. These numbers are using a more dimensional approach to the diagnosis, um, where we're not sort of using the very rigid arbitrary thresholds that the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual uses. So like to get a diagnosis of bipolar disorder, you have to have a manic episode that has at least three of seven specific symptoms. But having two of those symptoms can be really impairing too that's diagnosed as subthreshold bipolar one disorder. The important takeaway here, like much more important than the specific numbers is that anxiety disorders and unipolar depression, the disorders that we've talked about so far in class are quite common. So common that you definitely know someone who has one or the other, if not both. Bipolar disorder, the bipolar spectrum is the first disorder that we're talking about in this class that's relatively rare. Um, unlike depression and unlike anxiety disorders, bipolar disorders are equally common in men and women. And when disorders 
don't have a gender difference, that is often taken as evidence that these disorders have more, um, more biological predisposing factors and fewer environmental predisposing factors. In bipolar disorder, we consider this a disorder that someone is pretty much born with and the only precipitation from the environment is precipitation that activates pre-existing risk. You can contrast this with depression where because of learned helplessness, someone who experiences enough chronic stress and loss and failure may develop a negative cognitive style and may start to experience the world and behave in ways that perpetuate depression, um, even someone who doesn't have a lot of underlying biological predisposition. There's really no amount of environmental stressors that can cause someone to have a manic episode who doesn't have biological predispositions. And this is the first disorder where this is true. When a disorder is equally common in men and women, that's often an indication that the predisposition is almost completely biological and that the predisposition is really, really necessary for someone to express the symptoms. 90% of people with bipolar spectrum disorder have more than one episode. So whereas with depression, about 50% of people who have one major depressive episode never go on to have a recurrence, recurrence is the rule in people with bipolar spectrum disorders. This is one of the more deadly disorders. And this is why bipolar disorder along with um, schizophrenia, well, you know what, that's kind of a, it's a problematic designation, but bipolar disorder and schizophrenia together are often referred to as severe mental illness. One reason that people say that they're called severe mental illness is because they have, they're so deadly. They're much more um, likely to lead to morbidity, which means like physical impairment, physical illness, um, or like disability, inability to work or participate in life because of the disorder um, or death by suicide. However, we don't include substance use disorders and we don't always include eating disorders when we talk about severe mental illness, even though both of these disorders have really high mortality rates. And that's frankly because we know that bipolar disorder and schizophrenia, again, are extremely biologically um, predisposed. And there's more victim blaming of people who have substance use disorders and eating disorders. And that victim blaming is obviously misplaced, but part of where it's coming from is that substance use disorders and eating disorders are closer to anxiety disorders and depression in that anyone could develop them with the right environmental stressors, whereas not anyone can develop bipolar spectrum disorders or schizophrenia regardless of their environment. These are disorders that have a very, very strong biological component. So rather than calling them severe mental illnesses, I'm gonna just call them highly heritable, highly genetic, very biologically mediated mental illnesses. Some of the worst prognostic indicators in depression are some of these specifiers. So when your mood and depressive episodes cycle rapidly, when you experience anxious agitation during your mood episodes, um, and when you experience a longer duration of untreated disorder, especially untreated mania, as well as when you have more severe manifestations of depression, these are all indicators that your course of illness will be worse and that you'll be less responsive to treatment. Better prognostic indicators are, they really more relate to social support and probably privilege. So the more educated you are, the more social support you have. And one measure of that is whether you're married and the shorter your duration of illness was before you sought treatment, those all indicate a less severe, more treatment responsive course. In some of those same longitudinal studies that followed people over many years and repeatedly asked them questions about depression, those studies that gave us a much higher prevalence of depression than retrospective epidemiology does because people forget about depressive episodes, there's no evidence from those studies that people ever forget about manic episodes. Manic episodes are very memorable. They are very different from normal functioning. People do forget about hypomanic episodes. The age of onset for bipolar disorder, bipolar one disorder tends to be um, earlier than the age of onset for bipolar two disorder. And that's more than likely because they are manifestations of the same disorder, but bipolar one is a more severe manifestation. So less environmental precipitation is needed to activate it. This is one example of 
a prospective epidemiological study. And it's a, a relatively limited one because it's really only looking at the period of late adolescence and early young adulthood. The key takeaway here though, is that when people have a major depressive episode, there's a decent chance that their illness won't recur. Um, there's a fairly strong chance that, um, wait, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, I'm explaining this poorly. Let me back up and let me also make sure that I'm currently recording. Okay, sorry. Okay, so the key takeaway from this is that having a major depressive episode doesn't raise your risk of having a subsequent hypomanic or manic episode. Having a hypomanic or manic episode substantially increases your risk of having a major depressive episode. So the colors of these bars reflect the type of mood episode that someone had had when they entered the study. People were recruited for this study who had had manic or hypomanic episodes in the past or who had had major depressive episodes in the past. And then a control group was recruited who had had neither kind of mood episode before. So these are quote unquote healthy controls, but healthy in the sense that they have not had a mood episode in the past. So the majority of these of the healthy controls, people who had not had a mood episode before entering the study, continued to not have mood episodes over the 10 years that they were followed. About 10% of them went on to have a major depressive episode during the study period, but again, this was a relatively short follow-up time. Very few of them, um, around 2% collectively, experienced either hypomania or mania, with hypomania being more common. The key takeaway here is that when you compare the, the rate of people experiencing hypomania and mania um, who had never had a mood episode to those who had had a historical major depressive episode, the risk of hypomania and mania is about the same. The risk of depression is higher for people who had had a previous mood episode. But what this is showing is that having had a major depressive episode puts you at risk for depression in the future, but it does not put you at risk for mania or hypomania. Depression is really common. Um, so just knowing that someone has had a depressive episode basically tells you almost nothing about their chances of ever having a manic or a hypomanic episode compared to someone who's never had a mood episode before. So people with bipolar disorder experience both mania and depression. And so far we focused a lot on what the mania they experience is like, although we have said that the depression they experience tends to be more severe and is more likely to have psychotic features. But it's important to talk about depression and bipolar disorder because 90% at least, or sorry, 97% at least of people who have bipolar one disorder have depression at some point in their life. And in fact, people with bipolar one and two disorders spend a lot more of their time depressed than they spend hypomanic. Um, on average, people with bipolar disorder spend 57% of their time depressed versus 16% manic, which translates to three times as many depressed days as manic days. What, the, what this also translates to is that when someone is in a manic episode, we know that they have bipolar disorder because that's the, the definitional factor for bipolar disorder. Mania is much more short-lived than depression. So there's a higher chance of recovery from a given manic episode than a given depressive episode. And people in a manic episode are likely to return to euthymia faster on average than people in a depressive episode. Mania doesn't tend to last as long. So, I want to dispel some common misconceptions about bipolar disorder because this is this is a term that people can use colloquially, which can confuse our definitions about what it actually is. So bipolar disorder is not having mood swings. In fact, it's kind of the opposite. It's getting your mood stuck at one or the other end of the mood spectrum for a significantly long time. Like we talked about way at the beginning of this unit, mood is supposed to be kind of transitory it's supposed to be reactive to what's happening around you. But when someone is in a mood episode, their mood gets stuck. Either two weeks of depressive symptoms or one week of manic symptoms is what's required to diagnose a mood episode in bipolar disorder. So people just with bipolar disorder aren't rapidly shifting back and forth from manic to depressed or from happy to sad. Um, they're experiencing discrete periods of time where they're persistently manic or persistently sad. In someone with mixed features, again, there's no shifting, there's no mood swings happening from moment to moment. Features of both mania and depression are simultaneously present for a prolonged amount of time. 
mood is much less responsive and much less likely to swing in response to things that are happening to the person. People with bipolar disorder don't have split personalities. They're not a different person when they're manic. Um, mania and depression are both departures from normal functioning. People know that they're not being themselves. They're not acting the way that they normally act, but they're not acting like another person. They're acting like themselves depressed or themselves manic. In fact, as we'll talk about in class, there's a certain personality type that is associated with elevated risk for bipolar disorder. And people who have bipolar disorder are more likely to have this hypomanic personality type and express it even when they're euthymic. So the way that they are when they're in a manic episode is more just like an exaggeration of their typical personality. It's, if you think about what you would be like if you had a manic episode, you wouldn't be a completely different person. You would have all the same interests. You would have a lot of the same goals and desires that you have now. You would just have a lot of energy, a lot of motivation to accomplish your goals and lose insight about how realistic your goals and ideas are. As we talked about earlier in this lecture, another common misconception is that mania feels good. It doesn't. It often, because mania tends to worsen the longer it lasts, it often starts out feeling pretty good, but it can get really scary and really unpleasant as it gets more intense. In the case of people who have mixed episodes, mania can, can co-occur with really negative depressed mood. It can also co-occur with anxious mood. And when people have psychotic symptoms, it's almost always really terrifying. People with borderline personality disorder, which we're gonna talk about a couple units from now, are sometimes misdiagnosed with bipolar disorder because of these misconceptions, especially because of the misconception relating to mood swings. People with borderline personality disorder have moods that are actually overly reactive to the things that are going on around them. And they do experience rapid shifts from really positive affect to really negative affect in response to external stimuli. So borderline personality disorder is not bipolar personality disorder, further complicated by the fact that they're both sometimes called BPD. Okay, so people who are bipolar with bipolar disorder spend a lot of their time in a depressive episode. People with unipolar depression, people who have had a major depressive episode in the past are no more likely than anyone else to go on to experience mania or hypomania. So how are bipolar disorder and major depressive disorder really related? To start with, getting back to this concept of severe mental illness or mental illnesses that are predominantly biologically driven, mania is much more heritable than major depression. The heritability of major depressive disorder is only 32%. We'll talk more about what heritability estimates mean in the psychosis lectures, but basically that 32% is the percentage of variability in a trait that we see in the population that can be accounted for or explained by someone's genes. In other words, so this isn't to say that if your parents have major depression, you only have a 32% chance of having it yourself. It's more that if you were to take one person's depression, not that we can do this, but pretending that we could, if you took that person's depression, 32% of what goes into explaining why they're depressed right now is just their genetic risk. The other 68% is unrelated to their genes. It's their life experiences, the stressors that they've been through, the traumas they've been exposed to, the environment that they're in right now, the way that they think and the way that they're acting. That's the other 68%. So major depressive disorder is much less explained by someone's genetic risk factors and therefore by their biology than bipolar disorder. So the heritability of overall bipolar spectrum disorders is around 62%. So you can explain 62% of why someone is manic right now with because of their genes, because of their biology. Bipolar 1 disorder is even more highly heritable. It's 83% heritable. So 83% of why someone has bipolar 1 disorder is because they inherited it in their genes. So we talked way early on about twin studies, which is a way of helping us understand overlapping genetic risk. One way to do this is to identify sets of identical and um, fraternal twins where one twin has depression or bipolar disorder. And we look at the risk of depression or bipolar disorder in their co-twin 
we would expect for a disorder that's more heritable, where more of that disorder is predicted by someone's genes, that there'd be more concordance or more similarity between identical twins because they have identical genes. From twin studies, what we know is that the overlapping risk for mania and depression comes from overlapping risk for depression. So when you have an identical twin who has bipolar, who has unipolar disorder, you have a high risk of having unipolar disorder yourself. That's the part of the heritability of major depress depression that's being accounted for by your genes. But you have a low risk of bipolar disorder. You have the same risk of bipolar disorder as the population, just like that longitudinal epidemiological study showed. Someone who had depression is no more likely to go on to have mania than someone who never had a mood disorder. Someone who has a twin with unipolar depression is no more likely to go on to develop mania than someone who has a twin who has no psychopathology. However, if you have a twin who has bipolar disorder, you're at elevated risk for both bipolar disorder and unipolar major depression. So the genetic risk for bipolar disorder is the same as the genetic risk for major depression plus extra genetic risk. Some ways that we kind of know that the depression in bipolar disorder may have more genetic um, risk behind it is that it tends to have an earlier onset than unipolar depression. It tends to be more severe. It tends to be more, more recurrent and it tends to be more endogenous or less precipitated by the environment. So all of these features of depression in bipolar disorder help us see that it's more driven by biological risk than unipolar major depression, than depression is for most people. So both bipolar disorder and major depressive disorder involve alterations in the functioning of the monoamine system. There may be a bigger role for dopamine in mania because dopamine is the monoamine that's really involved in motivation and energy and reward-driven goal-oriented behavior. We talked about the behavioral activation and behavioral inhibition systems when we talked about risk um, predisposition for anxiety disorders. There may be predisposing risk for mania involving alterations in the behavioral activation system, which is the other side of that dual process that governs reward-seeking, risk-taking behavior. People who are prone to mania may have an overly active behavioral activation system. Another way that bipolar disorder and major depressive disorder are related is that both of these mood states can be responsive to the environment. They can be responsive to activity level. So we talked about behavioral activation as a treatment for unipolar depression, which is basically, as you guys are practicing, planning and engaging in rewarding activities to try to break out of this negative vicious cycle of depression and inactivity. I am depressed, so I don't think I'll have fun going out with my friends, so I don't go out with my friends, so I don't have fun, so I'm more depressed. Behavioral activation basically involves like faking it till you make it, doing the things that used to be fun in the hopes that it will increase your experiences of positive emotion and help to disprove some of your negative expectations about what happens when you do activities. Mania can be triggered by kind of the opposite. When people have bipolar disorder, they have to be kind of careful about how many exciting or goal-oriented or rewarding activities they do. Because just like with depression, becoming too inactive and avoiding rewarding activities too much makes depression worse. In someone who's at risk for mania, engaging in too many rewarding, positive, exciting activities can actually increase their risk for having a manic episode. So both mania and depression can be triggered by the environment, depression by stress, and also by the tendency to withdraw and stop engaging in pleasant activities. Mania is kind of the opposite. It can be triggered by overstimulation, by excitement, and by engaging in too many goal-directed activities. Both unipolar depression and mania involve kindling, where the first episodes are more likely to be triggered by environmental stress or excitement. And the more recurrences you have of either depression or mania, the less they need to be triggered by the environment. The more they become endogenous, the more they become triggered by biological alterations that are caused by exposure to untreated depression or mania. Sleep plays a role in both ends of the mood spectrum. So we talked a lot about how sleep deprivation, um, well, alterations in sleep can trigger depressive episodes. One way that sleep can be altered is by changes in light exposure during seasonal changes. 
Another way that sleep can be altered is by stress. People might be sleeping more or less than they're used to during periods of stress. And so changing sleep um, can tip someone into a depressive episode. But when someone is depressed, depriving them of sleep elevates their mood. It can actually help someone get back to a euthymic mood state, but only temporarily. As soon as they sleep again, they go back to being depressed. In someone who's vulnerable to mania, sleep deprivation can actually trigger mania in someone with bipolar disorder. So we know that when someone is in a mood episode, when someone has the biological predisposition to mania, depriving them of sleep can trigger a manic episode. So the main takeaway here is that bipolar disorder is a mood disorder. It involves alterations in the monoamine system that help to regulate and control mood and other functions related to mood, like energy level, goal-directed behavior, self-esteem, motivation, appetite, sleep, energy, all that. Bipolar disorder is a more severe variant of major depressive disorder. They're both alterations in mood. Alterations in mood towards mania are more severe. They're less common. They have more biological risk and less environmental risk. People with bipolar disorder have the same genetic risk for depression that people with unipolar depression have, but they have extra genetic risk for mania too. And most people with bipolar depression therefore aren't particularly at risk for mania or bipolar disorder any more than anyone else is because unipolar depression is very common and can be um, precipitated by environmental stress or by biological predisposition, whereas mania and bipolar disorder are really rare and they need to be um, driven by biological predisposing factors. In bipolar disorder, the environment really only acts as a trigger for something that's already there. So we talked briefly about, well, we talked more than briefly about SSRIs when we talked about the monoamine system and the way that it becomes altered or the way that it is altered in someone who's predisposed to depression. Bipolar disorder is medicated differently. And in fact, even though the monoamine system is dysregulated in depression, Antidepressant medications alone are contraindicated because they can trigger a manic episode in someone who's vulnerable. The, one of the first successful treatments for any psychopathology was lithium. Lithium is a molecule, so it's not trademarked or patented by anyone. Anyone can make and sell lithium. Nobody owns it. Um, Lithium is really useful in treating acute mania. It really helps to stabilize someone's mood and bring them back to euthymia. Um, it's also taken prophylactically when someone is euthymic to prevent future mood episodes. There's a really high risk of suicide attempts and completion in people with bipolar disorder. And in addition to being able to prevent mania prophylactically, lithium seems to be really good at preventing suicide as well. Other treatments for bipolar disorder even though mania is a very effective treatment, it has a lot of side effects and it's really hard on the body. It can cause damage to the liver. And so people have to be on a lot of like heavy medical monitoring when they're taking lithium. It also has a high overdose potential. So other treatments for bipolar disorder include anticonvulsant mood stabilizers, which were drugs that were originally designed to treat epilepsy, but that actually have been found to be effective in stabilizing mood and helping people return from a manic state and prevent mania. Um, and atypical antipsychotics. So some of the same drugs that are taken to treat psychosis also have been found to be helpful for both depression and mania. As is the case with most, yeah, most psychotropic medications, we don't totally know why these drugs work, but one thing that they all have in common is that they're neuroprotective. So whereas SSRIs and drugs that increase the availability of monoamines increase neural plasticity, they promote cell growth. Drugs that are protective against mania protect against cell death. So they prevent cells from being damaged by whatever altered um, neurochemical state is present in mania and bipolar disorder. So there, there is psychotherapy for bipolar disorder, but importantly, psychotherapy is not used to treat mania in the way that we can use the tools of CBT to help someone who is depressed, get themselves from depressed to not depressed. Psychotherapy is really not useful during a manic episode because people really lack insight and they're, they're not thinking logically. 
Mania though tends to be short-lived and it is really responsive to medication. If you give someone lithium during a manic episode, they very quickly stop being manic. The problem is that they need to continue taking that lithium for the rest of their life to prevent future manic episodes. And because it's a difficult drug to take and because anticonvulsant mood stabilizers and atypical antipsychotics have fewer physical side effects, but more cognitive and emotional side effects, people with bipolar disorder sometimes have a hard time staying on medications. So that's one role of CBT, just helping people stay adherent to their medications and helping people cope with the side effects. But other evidence-based therapies, including CBT and interpersonal and social rhythm therapy, as well as family-focused therapy, all of this is about stabilizing someone's life and helping them maintain routines that help them identify triggers for mood episodes and proactively prevent those triggers from happening. Some of the triggers for manic episodes and for depressive episodes are stress and overstimulation. Well, not respectively. Stress can trigger a depressive episode and overstimulation can trigger a manic episode. People who are prone to manic episodes and also people who are prone to depression should maintain really regular sleep habits because alterations in sleep can trigger depression and sleep deprivation can trigger mania. People with bipolar disorder also need to be careful to manage their so social rhythms and social routines, basically to stop themselves from starting to overextend and overengage in exciting, pleasurable activities, because this can be a sign of the early stages of a manic episode. And if you let it continue, it can increase the severity of the manic episode and make it worse and worse. Um, and then also medication adherence is really important and psychotherapists, psychologists have a role in helping bipolar patients stay on their medication and manage the side effects. Family interventions primarily are used to improve communication with family members of people who have bipolar illness and also teach family members to help patients track their symptoms and track their triggers and medication adherence. So the last couple slides in this lecture address bipolar disorder in children and some of the fallout from controversies around bipolar disorder in children. So we know that in children, unipolar depression can present with irritable mood rather than sadness. And irritability, although it, it does happen in depression, it happens in GAD, it's more closely tied to manic mood states in adults. So because of this, there was a movement in like the 80s and 90s towards diagnosing irritable, moody, unhappy young children, and especially young children who acted out a lot with bipolar disorder. This movement kind of started because of the increasing availability of atypical antipsychotics and anticonvulsant mood stabilizers. Lithium is a really heavy duty drug and we're not good at dosing it in children. Um, because the dosing of lithium has to be so tightly maintained and it's so closely based on your metabolic activity and your body weight, these things in children are changing so fast. And children also tend to need much higher doses of drugs for them to be effective, that it's just really difficult and dangerous and almost never done to give lithium to children. So before there was a drug to treat it, we didn't diagnose bipolar disorder that much in kids. When drugs became available that were safer to give to kids, moody, irritable, aggressive or misbehaving children started to get the bipolar diagnosis more and more. This kind of came to a head in the early 2000s with a controversy over this increasing use of psychiatric medications um, with well-publicized deaths of children who were on these medications, one of whom was Rebecca Riley, who was a four-year-old um, whose parents were, were prosecuted for her murder because they over um, dosed her with drugs that she was prescribed. So she was prescribed atypical antipsychotics and stimulants for irritable, negative mood. She was diagnosed with bipolar disorder because of this. Around the same time, um, well-known psychologists like Joseph Biederman, who was a, actually is still a psychiatrist at Harvard, it came out that he had conflicts of interest in his research that he wasn't disclosing. He was someone who studied the treatment of bipolar disorder in young children with atypical antipsychotics, but failed to disclose that he was being given a lot of money and drug company shares by the companies that made the drugs he was studying. We now know that irritability in children is not mania, it's a sign of unipolar depression and real mania in children is, it may exist, but it's so rare 
that population-based studies can't even estimate how common it is because there aren't enough cases. However, cases like Rebecca Riley's highlight the need for a diagnosis and therefore an understanding and treatment for children who have persistent irritable mood. We know that they don't have bipolar disorder, but they do have a lot of behavioral problems. They have dysfunction, they have distress, they may have danger because kids with irritable mood are more likely to act out impulsively. So there is this group of symptoms that describes a group of kids. We used to call it bipolar disorder. We now know that's not what it is. Um, what it is, what we call it now is disruptive mood dysregulation disorder or DMDD. This is a unipolar mood disorder characterized by high levels of negative affect, not just sad mood or not just anhedonia, but also depression. Disruptive mood dysregulation disorder is highly comorbid with anxiety and with unipolar depression, but it's not highly comorbid with mania. And kids who have the DMDD diagnosis, they are more likely to grow up to have anxiety and depression. They're not more likely to grow up to have mania. So DMDD, persistent irritability, really is a unipolar mood disorder. It's characterized by severe anger outbursts of either verbal or physical aggression that are out of proportion to whatever triggered them and also developmentally inappropriate because children do have anger outbursts. So when you're assessing a child who has anger outbursts, you need to make sure that it's more than other kids their age. It also tends to occur across contexts. So it's not just that there's a problem with the child's home life or a child is struggling with school and so they have a lot of irritability and aggression there. It cuts across all of the domains in which they have to function and it occurs pretty frequently at least three times per week. So these are really extreme age inappropriate and persistent pervasive temper tantrums. In addition to having these outbursts, there's disturbed mood between outbursts. It's persistently irritable. It's not persistently sad. That might be a sign that the child also has comorbid depression and it's not persistently elevated. That would be mania, but mania is extremely, extremely rare in children. DMDD can co-occur with depression, but it has to be independent of depressed mood. So the anger outbursts have to happen even when the child is not in a depressive episode. And it can't be diagnosed in a child with a history of mania because DMDD can be diagnosed between six and 18. Mania can start with like late childhood, early adolescence. It doesn't happen in six-year-olds, but it can happen in 18-year-olds. DMDD is only a diagnosis of childhood. So this is a quick video with Dr. Ellen Liebenloff, who's one of the leading researchers on DMDD with NIH, talking about what DMD, DMDD looks like in children. last 10 or 15 years, there was this movement within child psychiatry. There were a number of important leaders in the field who had the idea that children with very severe irritability should be given the diagnosis of bipolar disorder, that this was a form of manic depressive illness in children, that children who are very irritable all the time, this was how bipolar disorder was presenting. And this was a controversial idea. So we did, we and others, did a series of studies on it. And basically what we found is that these children, these irritable children, do not grow up to have bipolar disorder. They don't grow up to have manic episodes, which is really the core part of bipolar disorder. Instead, these children grow up to have increased risk for anxiety and for depression, what's called unipolar depression, just major depression, not bipolar depression. So for this and other reasons, in the DSM-5, there was a new diagnosis created called Disruptive Mood Dysregulation Disorder. It's called DMDD for short. And these children really fit much better into that diagnosis than they do into bipolar disorder. Okay, so that's kind of a quick overview of how DMDD came about. Really quickly, um, there are treatments for DMDD. So the whole goal of creating this new diagnostic category 
is to first explain where the problems with behavior and emotion are coming from, and then to develop a treatment that targets the um, perpetuating mechanisms. So the way that DMDD is treated, and these treatments are actively being developed right now by researchers like Melissa Brotman at NIH, who works with Dr. Ellen Liebenloft. Liebenloft. So the treatment is basically a combination of parent management training. So teaching parents how to use positive and negative reinforcement to enforce children's pro-social positive behavior and negatively reinforce negative behavior like anger outbursts. Um, but there's also an element of exposure. So children who have anger or irritability outbursts that are disproportionate to the trigger that caused them are repeatedly exposed to those triggers, both to accomplish habituation and safety learning, learning that anger peaks and subsides on its own, just like anxiety, even if you don't act on it. The behavioral motivation associated with anger is, tends to be approach, it tends to be like aggression or violence. Whereas the behavioral, um, the behavior associated with anxiety as a mood state is avoidance. But either way, if you feel the emotion and don't act on it, the emotion will still go away. Moods are very temporary and transient. So that's what people learn through exposure to their anger triggers. They also learn to recognize the early physical signs of oncoming irritable mood and anger so that those anger outbursts don't catch them by surprise anymore. So that they start to notice like, oh, when I am around this thing that makes me angry, the first thing I notice is my heart starts to beat faster. I notice that my muscles feel really tense. I notice that I'm grinding my teeth. And when I notice these things, I can choose to de-escalate the situation. I can choose to leave the situation if I need to. Um, I don't have to let myself escalate into full-blown anger. So basically what, what the treatment is for DMDD is to teach parents to manage behavior problems while teaching kids to regulate their emotions when they're feeling angry and upset. And this is a huge departure from treating these kids with heavy duty antipsychotics and anticonvulsants that affect things like metabolism and cognition and learning. DMDD is a disorder limited to childhood. There is another disorder that can be diagnosed in people of all ages that's very similar, but different in really one key way. And I'm just highlighting it here because DMDD and intermittent explosive disorder are the only disorders in DSM that involve alterations in the experience of anger. Just like anxiety, sadness, and disgust, anger it can be adaptive when, it's, when it happens in response to the right situations. But there are people who experience anger more intensely in response to more different stimuli, stimuli or who um, don't handle their experience of anger well behaviorally and act on it in inappropriate ways, just like with anxiety and sadness. Um, and DMDD and intermittent explosive disorder are the only diagnoses in DSM-5 that recognize that right now. So IED is marked by the same kind of extreme anger outbursts that DMDD is marked by. But unfortunately, whereas DMD, DMDD is a disorder limited to childhood and adolescence, IED can be diagnosed in adults. And some of the signs of IED include things like road rage, domestic violence, or getting really angry and hurting yourself, like punching or biting yourself in anger. I'm talking about IED and DMDD in this lecture because they are both often mistaken for bipolar disorder, even though they couldn't be more different. Bipolar disorder involves persistent alterations in mood at both ends of the spectrum, elated, and very depressed. In order to be diagnosed with a manic episode, the elation has to last seven days. In order to be diagnosed with a depressive episode, it has to last two weeks. Those cutoffs are kind of arbitrary, but the point is the mood is persistent. In DMDD and IED, the anger outbursts are brief but explosive. In DMDD, disruptive mood dysregulation disorder, there's also an alteration in mood between episodes of anger the mood is persistently irritable. This is not true in IED. In IED, people can be euthymic between episodes of anger. And so that's really the key difference between IED and DMDD. IMDD is just these extreme, explosive, seemingly unpredictable anger outbursts that occur in relatively infrequently. They're, it's not an everyday thing. In DMDD, the anger outbursts are also relatively infrequent, they're happening at least three times a week, but the mood between them is also dysfunctional and distressing. It's persistently irritable. These are both mood disorders and they also both involve alterations in the monoamine system. Serotonin is one of the, is the main neurotransmitter that's involved in regulating aggressive behavior. 
So people with alterations in the monoamine system that make them prone to depression and mania are also prone to these disorders of inappropriate extreme anger. Okay, that was a bit of a long one, but some takeaways from the bipolar spectrum. So bipolar disorder is characterized by depression plus mania, whereas unipolar depression, just depression. Mania and hypomania basically have all the same symptoms, but mania is a more extreme manifestation of those symptoms. The way that we make the cutoff clinically is when those symptoms become impairing in some way, when the person experiences them as distressing, when it causes dysfunction in relationships or in social or occupational functioning, or when the person becomes a danger to themselves and others and is hospitalized, or when they become psychotic. Unipolar depression and bipolar disorder do, they are the same disorder in that they both share risk for depression. Bipolar disorder includes additional risk for mania. So mania is separate from unipolar depression, but someone with bipolar disorder has risk for both. So again, because they're, because depression itself is separate and distinct from the risk of mania, most people with a history of depression aren't at elevated risk for mania. Two features of someone with depression that do indicate that they have elevated risk of bipolar illness are if they have really, really severe depression, especially psychotic depression, and if they have a family history of bipolar spectrum disorders, because these are very heritable disorders. Mania is extremely rare in children, so rare that it's almost impossible to find in population studies. Yet we have this terrible history of over-medicating kids who are irritable, moody, and aggressive, and who may have extreme anger outbursts. We now diagnose this as disruptive mood dysregulation disorder, a unipolar mood diagnosis for kids with mood disturbance that's characterized by persistent irritability, and that also features angry outbursts. In adults, we don't make the diagnosis based on this persistent irritability. We really only focus on the angry outbursts, and that's diagnosed as intermittent explosive disorder. Okay. So that is the end for today. I apologize if that's a little bit long, but I will see you guys in class.